There were four experiments regarding the Ouija board, from what I have seen. Three of these cases showed no significant supernatural events, other than flickering of an entity. The fourth and final one demanded a cessation of these trials, once they recovered all the parts they could find. Experiment. Ouija. Number zero four. Final. Three couples had been manipulated into performing on a Ouija board inside an abandoned home that had been fitted with surveillance cameras and microphones. Two of these couples were not strong believers in the supernatural, not completely close-minded, however. The primary couple were religious, but not aggressively so. They brought a Ouija board from their home and chatted casually while setting up the board and planchette. The secondary and tertiary couples were not thrilled when they saw the board itself, but complied with the urging to partake. Customary opening rituals were performed with what is believed to be a prayer. The audio did not reflect this. All that could be heard was screaming and begging for mercy for several minutes while the three couples just sat there, praying. As they finished... The screaming stopped, and they asked the opening question. The only camera that didn't immediately turn to static was the one in the living area, where the Ouija board was set up. When I reviewed the tapes for archiving, I determined it's to be smoke, not static. Not sure how we got different observations regarding this. As the question stated properly, there would be movements in the static slash smoke. Humanoid at times, and not at other times. The noises made from these locations resembled growling. Not bestial. More primal. The only properly functioning camera revealed a seventh entity within that room. A tall humanoid with black skin and warped legs. It wasn't looking at the couples, but directly into the camera. The primary couple were a bit more energetic than the other two couples, for indiscernible reasons. The microphone in that area wasn't transmitting the conversation, even though it was working up until the completion of the opening question. The notes from the researcher spearheading this indicated that he could hear the couples talking just fine. They were trying to contact the spirit of a deceased grandmother of the male of the tertiary couple. Names would be given but the remains were not identified, just matched to what was left. Three minutes of questions later, the primary male glanced at a mirror and noticed the humanoid staring at them via the reflection. He went to yell, but was unable to make a sound. The others glanced at him oddly. Then a voice came from the primary male. Impossibly deep. The voice demanded they resume the experiment. This was underlined in the notes as well. When someone would attempt to question, the humanoid would raise a hand and scratch the air, but wounds would appear on the interjector. The voice would demand they resume. The face of the entity would flinch, like something not used to a facial structure would try to emulate a smile they saw someone else do from a great distance. The question became intensely personal, and going by the investigation conducted by the organization, the answers given were false. The questions were for those of a perverted sense of morality. The answers would be dragged out by the planchette, while the other five would vainly attempt to remove themselves. The entity's body started to flinch in what would be approximated as laughter. The notes from the experiment stop abruptly during an observation that some aberration was making their way down the hall. It is here, and it is happy. Those are the last lines from the case file. The footage goes black. There would be a two-day pause. Then the head researcher, who was personally overseeing the experiment, would be located in a remote Danish bed and breakfast and parts of the six volunteers would be discovered in the bed. When the matter was brought to the attention of local police, the organization was able to take control over the case and subsequent investigations.
The room was covered in uncoagulated blood and fecal matter. Phrases in a language thought to be Latin were seen, but the translation team were unable to translate. They tried the rest of the global human lexicon with no success. The translation team would complain of seeing a writhing humanoid form haunting them three days before they commit impossible suicides. One was found hanging by a spider web. One had shot themselves in the head with no gun, residue, or casing. Just a hole that matched a 38 caliber bullet with no indication of significant velocity. Just trace amounts of unignited gunpowder. The other swallowed medicinal pills, not available for commercial release for another three years, as the chemical formula was still being worked on. Three left feet, five right feet, two right hands, four left hands, all missing fingers, four and one-third of a torso, three and a half pairs of legs, six sets of teeth, four skulls, all dismembered pre-mortem. The aforementioned body parts were found in the same bed as the head researcher who woke up to the sight and screamed. The DNA was able to match up what was found to the missing couples. Semen was found on various pieces that matched the head researcher. The head researcher states that after everything went black on the screens, the entity abducted him and forced him to endure torture for a period of time that he has no words to describe other than hellish. He stated he could see the couples were suffering lesser forms of torture, but the entities inflicting the pain and agony highlighted that the head researcher was to blame, as he wanted to see if demons and hell were real. Autopsies of the parts recovered show multiple fractures on the skeletal structure and tearing of muscles. Torsos had the traditional Y cuts of an autopsy. However, the scarring indicates that the wounds healed multiple times. The head researcher refused to fall asleep, saying he sees them when he closes his eyes, whether he is referring to the demons or the people whose torture he caused, he will refuse to clarify. The head researcher also shows the same autopsy scarring. No further research is planned regarding the Ouija board, and I have asked the morticians that if they hear anyone moronic enough to try another experiment to notify me immediately so I can kill them. I am sorry for the delays in posting these case files, but it turns out, since my efforts regarding the infiltrated military base, I will be doing some field work with the retired mortician. We are to head to Scandinavia in the next couple of days. The mortician and I have returned from our excursion to Scandinavia. It was enlightening. We flew to Oslo first. The airport was busy, as you could imagine, but the mortician and I were fairly silent during the flight, except answering the questions asked by the air hosts. Our luggage for this leg was fairly light, only a few days of clothing and toiletries. The mortician didn't understand why I didn't want us to take cold weather and hiking gear from the U.S. I pointed out the climatic and geographical differences for the areas we would be hiking through compared to the majority of the United States. In Norway and other regions of the Scandinavian area, the gear would be better suited for their climates and terrain. So, buying it from there would be a wiser choice. We dropped our luggage off at the hotel and went shopping. We got boots, jackets, a couple of tents, and other hiking utensils. We also got a couple of larger suitcases to help us cart our new gear as we got closer to our next phase of this journey. One long bus trip to a place name we mangled in our pronunciation later, we had been in Norway for a couple of days. During the bus journey, there was an odd sensation like I'm walking through a garden and the owners are very keen on my presence. It is a very weighty sensation. We headed to our new hotel for a couple of days, and we looked into the local legends of the small town we are in. Nothing overly promising, but I did voice the experience I had on the journey. We asked around and got the 
look at the funny American tourist's reaction from most of the people in the town. But the mortician and I had instructions to follow. The task of trying to locate any trolls in the Scandinavian area. Given my military background and the funds the mortician was working with, we would be able to navigate the wilderness fairly well. The local populace mentioned some of the more dangerous plants in the area. We packed up and headed off, making sure to tell the local police station that we were planning on a week-long hike. Not much happened on the first day, and it was the second day when we both felt the judgmental gaze upon us. Mid-morning on the third day, we found a large rock covered with moss. I remember the initial research I did on these cryptids, and their believed behavioral patterns. There was what looked to be a part of a wall behind the rocks. Scandinavian trolls were believed to have thrown rocks at churches. I looked around and saw that the hillside area seemed a little odd. I approached carefully. The mortician watched warily. Hello, man. A voice grated. Have you ever bitten a metal fork and you get that awkward sensation of metal on teeth? That's what the voice sounded like, but for the entire skeleton. The mortician approached. Truth seeker, the voice stated. Why are you two here? I could see a set of eyes staring out from the hillside, watching us with a timeless gaze. There was an actual troll. It appears to be sitting down, so I cannot give an accurate observation regarding its size. But from its huddled position, it was at least four stories high. We seek to know more about you, the mortician called out. The troll focused his gaze and spoke. How many pulp men? I know of three, I answered. The mortician gripped my shoulder with surprising tightness and adds, Twelve more, that we know of. And those out of time? The troll was more insistent on this question. I started to answer, stating that I was unsure of what he meant when the mortician spoke up. Twenty. Eight were Pope men. The troll nodded and closed his eyes. We resume slumber. Our watch will start soon. He grated. Day was slipping away, and we would need to camp soon. We set up our camp, and I waited for the mortician to speak. Very rarely, one of the corpses we get is for someone not in our time period. Never from the future, always from the past. Sometimes, these are also pulp men, as the troll calls them, he explains formally. I shake my head at the thoughts of the pulp men. Not cryptids in the traditional sense, just people who died repeatedly under so many causes of death it was literally impossible to determine the cause. The accumulated injuries turned the skeleton, muscle, and organs into pulp. Autopsies are messy affairs. We ate some MREs and extinguished our very small fire. We turned in for the night. Some of it, anyway. Crashing was the only warning we got. Something very big was charging through. Elephant or rhino size. I clambered out of my tent and saw a very tall humanoid running right at me. Hollow man. It declared. The mortician was making his way out of his tent when I ran. Grab your stuff and leave Norway. I shouted as I ran past. The thundering of the being behind me was like the base of a vehicle cranking to obscene levels. I didn't run out of fear, per se. I just knew that this thing wanted to kill and or eat me. Running lengthened my life expectancy in strides. 
running through a Norwegian forest, being chased by something that would dwarf an elephant, knowing it wants to eat you just for existing, is an experience I never wish to repeat. The only slightly saving grace for me, as the odd hour's light seems to have in this part of the northern hemisphere. I could barely make out the roots, thick bushes, and fallen branches. I used prey tactics to survive. I took sharp turns up to 90 degrees. I ran close or through very thick parts of the forest. This forced the thing to slow down a little bit. I made it to a large open area after emerging from the forest. I ran a bit ahead and turned to face this thing. Why do you seek to kill me? I yelled. The thing slowed to a stop. It was a tall, bulky-looking human with bulbous facial features, except for the eyes, which were set in quite deep into its face. Hollow Man will end the world with a broken time. Eat, Hollow Man. The world will live. It growled. Would all trolls know this? I asked. Hollow Man should stop talking. I spoke with a troll yesterday. He didn't know me. I might not be the Hollow Man that will break time. I write about strange things in the world. Gods and fo followers? It asked, stuttering slightly. No. Dogmen, skinwalkers, wendigo, pulpmen, demons. The things that live in this world that the world try to ignore or hide from. Time is not my concern. Strange creatures are. I stated. Dogmen. Not natural. Troll talk. It said, turning back the way we came. I talk, troll. Hollow man can leave. But if I see you again, I eat you. It says, as it straightens itself up and walks the way we ran from. I watch it walk away before walking away myself. As I did, I pondered what I knew about these cryptids, trolls and ogres. I am of the view that the being that chased me was a Norwegian troll, known for consuming the flesh of those of the Christian faith. I consider these to be ogres, powerful creatures, but not overly bright. They grow or consume enough to grow into trolls. Trolls have a greater purpose in the view of our world. I just have no idea what it could be. While there are some known cryptids in the water, either in the depths of the ocean or the relative shallows of inland lakes and rivers, they are more likely to submerge rather than cause acts of violence that would bring the attention of the morticians to their activities. But there is a cryptid that is closely tied to the waters. There have been sightings of these creatures, though not as many as the large case files I have to document. Referred to as the Montauk Monster, and reported as a hairless sloth, it turns out that there is more to these creatures that the mainstream media do not wish to report. While I may find it unusual, those with an emotional rage greater than Edward Cullen in those movies may find it very disconcerting. Case file. Cryptid. Aquatic. Montauk. Number 0386. The location of this body is near the city of Seattle, Washington, in the United States. The body was recovered at 0310 on April 10th, 1970. The body was washed ashore and spotted by a passerby. The desk sergeant who got the call was an informant for the morticians, who, after hearing about another Montauk, notified them immediately. The body was examined and the results were noted down. Autopsy. The cause of death was suffocation. The biology, as noted in the other Montauk autopsies, notes that the creature was adept to aquatic life, as evidenced by the gills on the side of the neck and beneath the armpits. 
The skin is soft, and the evidence of scale molting is detectable around the hands and feet. The brain is shown to have regressed from the original human body. The skeletal structure is a misnomer, as the skeleton is more elongated cartilage, and the musculature of the spine has been redesigned to allow a hands-free swimming form of locomotion. Speculation on the Montauks As this is all theoretical and conjecture, there has been no case of a living Montauk being captured to prove or deny these theories. It is believed that very, very rare individuals who have been involved in a crash involving vehicles and deep waters that they go to an emergency evolution slash de-evolution. These highly unique individuals are theoretical, as the DNA of the Montauks and regular humans is different in some key areas. However, DNA tracing shows similarities to certain bloodlines around the world. However, the rest is mixed with fish DNA, which takes into account the gills and scales. Why Montauks beach themselves like whales is a mystery, though it is believed that a dormant part of the mind that has access to memories of being on land, they try to replicate that and suffocate. Though the groupings of these creatures have been brought to repeat action. Panama, Japan, Australia, theoretically, and the coastlines of the U.S. seem to be the major points of these creatures, but the reasons are not readily apparent. Given the history of these creatures, it is unlikely they are in any way related to the military dogman experiments. The forced combination of fish and human DNA would not be readily viable. Dolphin would theoretically be better, but we are not here to correct the scientific experiments of those with no moral compass, just to document the strange creatures of this world, and any corpses that either make or leave behind. As I read over the case files of these Montauk creatures, I am surprised at the lack of theory regarding the mythical city of Atlantis as a viable possibility, but there might be something in these case files regarding this. The retired mortician has popped in to see me a few times since we made it back from our encounter with the troll and ogre. He has never autopsied a Montauk, observing that if he had, then maybe the mush corpse wouldn't have affected him so badly. His skin pales again at the thought of his last autopsy he performed, but he doesn't vomit, which is progress. I'm curious about these Montauk creatures, if the theory is true that there are truly rare humans who can do a rapid form of evolution, I ponder whether it is a step forwards or backwards for evolution in human beings. The former mortician has asked if I would be willing to accompany him on further excursions, or even actual cryptid hunts, for the more dangerous ones out there. I stated in explicit terms that I would not hunt a skinwalker without significant firepower or greater knowledge of them. That was when the mortician showed me files I had pushed aside in favor of more intriguing cryptids. He noted that all other cryptids seemed to abandon areas where mush corpses were recovered for months. As I have repeated these mush corpses in the past, I will give a very brief overview. Mush corpses are humans who have, thanks to modern technology and the ability to record audio, have apparently been subjected to hundreds of deaths in a perverse Groundhog Day loop and then after whatever causes them to suffer deaths that are literally impossible, the body would be found in a public area to be recovered. However, the overwhelming trauma has reduced everything that is not the skin into mush. This isn't visually detectable. Other tactile inspections reveal the horrifying discovery. It is of little wonder why these discoveries force morticians to quit, and apparently swear off soft foods altogether. Even the ambulance drivers who have to transport the body quit immediately after delivering of the body. At first it was assumed that the deaths were caused by some unknown organism. However, due to the aforementioned commercial flooding of portable recording technology, you can listen to every single death the victim has endured. 
They seem to be unaware of their fates unless they can see the cause. The one thing that really makes these bodies so upsetting is that the skin is completely unharmed. Apparently, cleaning up after yet another attempted autopsy on these bodies is almost as bad as the autopsy attempt itself. While I was pursuing the case files in regards to coastline accounts to get more information on the water-based cryptids, I found an unsettling account that, while not at all related, makes me, of all people, feel uncomfortable. This town was not based on the coastline, but it was within 50 miles. The original population was 263 before the event. The name has been scrubbed thoroughly from any historical records that I have access to, which, given the Mortician Network and their affiliates' networks, I can't find it anywhere. While the Morticians mainly deal with corpses of, or made by cryptids, this was an isolated incident, until I found six other towns who also suffered the same disconcerting fates. No known pattern, country, or any motive could be discerned. Case file. Incident Candyland. Town 01. In the year 1873, there was a town whose name is no longer recorded who went silent. The neighboring communities investigated this unusual activity and at first found nobody walking around the town. A deputy who had made the trip decided to investigate further. He entered a small saloon. He submitted his investigation in the report below. I came to... After Mr. Sampson reported that the farmers hadn't set their shipment of oats, the sheriff sent me to investigate. Traveling wasn't too bad, as it was a place I had been to from time to time. But as I drew closer, my stomach started to churn uncomfortably. Pressing on, as I trotted into the main town hall area, I felt something very bad had happened. I had seen no children, no farmers, nobody. It was a ghost town. A ghost town won't haunt me like what I saw in the saloon. Entering the saloon, I saw three people sitting around a table in the middle of a game of cards, and the barkeep was behind the bar. But the first thing that tipped me off was the air smelled sickly sweet. None of them were moving. I walked towards the card players, but they never reacted to me. I called out to them, but they were like dummies. The sweet smell got stronger. I grabbed the shoulder of one of the men, and it felt... wrong. The arm didn't feel right. I backed off and swore. I looked closer, and the skin looked wrong. My guts were telling me to run, but I didn't want to think what the sheriff would call me. I headed to the barkeep, and he just stood there. He never moved. That smell came again. Not as strong as the others, but it was still there. When I looked at the barkeep, I saw something very wrong. His eyes were gone. No blood. It looked like hard candy. I ran. I forgot my horse until I made it to the sheriff's office back home. The sheriff and the doctor arrived to investigate and they found that all 263 inhabitants had undergone the same effect. The sheriff left the doctor to work. He autopsied all of the people. Given the near-identical results, only differing in volume due to body size, the components of what the bodies were turned into will be listed below. The skin is tougher, similar to leather, there had been no damage to the skin, other than the fact that it had been treated to make it tougher. The fatty tissue underneath is cooking fat that was cold and slightly solid. Muscle tissue has become candy floss. 
cartilage is replaced with taffy, and the bones are dried sugar, compacted into the skeletal form. The lungs also appeared to be a form of taffy as well. The organs below, where the diaphragm would be, is a meaty stew. The brain is caramelized popcorn. Over 250 people, all ages, affected. And nobody can figure out why. The doctor, after conducting the autopsies, quit. And, according to reports left town whenever a traveling carnival arrived. Apart from the fact that the bodies were still recognizably human, given the transformed composition, there were no ambient sounds, other than the wind. There were no flies, crickets, bees, wasps, or any other loud insect. No birds sang, no dogs or cats. Just silence. The animals that were on the farms were missing. This was deeply unsettling to read, but while this village was in the United States, there have been three small townships in the Europe area, one in Great Britain, one in Germany, and the other in Romania. Russia even admitted that it happened to one of their townships, but that is all they will officially say regarding this event. The sixth was actually in China, but, again, the reports are as detailed as an opposition ballot to Vladimir Putin. While there are other traveling carnivals or circuses who have unusual effects, this one, as far as I have read, is the most disturbing. Having tracked the majority of the carnivals at the time via very old newspaper clippings and journal entries that could be retrieved, it is literally impossible for this carnival to exist. Except, it has struck six times that we know of. And this is all we know. The last report was a little over 40 years ago. And as much as the technology boom has dampened people's interest in going to the circus or a carnival, but some older traditions are showing a resurgence. God forbid this happens again especially to a larger population center. The morticians seem to find this event reoccurring unlikely, and I do suspect they may be right. I just wish I had more time to read over the military experiment files regarding the dogmen. That might make for easier reading, and there are so many other files for me to comb through. Maybe I'll read about a ghoul or something. Something to ease my mind would be highly appreciated. Fortunately, for the person who named this incident, they were already dead. If they weren't, they would be very shortly.